you are sharing the screen. Rams, can you see it? No? I'm able to see your screen. You Hello. need to display the PowerPoint file. Can you see it now? No. So when you, what do you do is when you share screen, can you share your entire um, desktop and then open the PPT file? Okay, Sunil, uh, Sunil, I can do the following thing. I, can you hear me, Sunil? Sunil? I think he may, I, 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 I don't know. Sometimes I have similar problems and if I reboot my whole computer, it really resolves the problem. There's, yeah, it, it's just, um, <laughs> I have Microsoft, and if I don't uh, update it, it just kicks me out. <laughs> okay, Sunil, we don't have any more time. So, Sudita, can you share your screen and then be ready? Um, Sunil, um, can you hear us? Sunil, please send it. Like, uh, you can email me. We can uh, continue corresponding on the email. Oh, what? No, no, Sudipta. No. Oh, Sudipta. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll. Do I have his email, Rams? If you push uh, me his you, you email so I can uh, send him an email. You oh, you can, you, you can just say, send to everybody that this is my email so he can communicate to me. Sunil, can you hear us? It's one more minute, calm down. Magda, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me, I, I think I have to share yeah. the slides. Sunil, Sunil, listen. No, 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 wait, Sunil. Yeah, I'm listening. Hello? Okay, Sunil, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Sunil. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? So we need, we need to get started. So I will send you. A, just, yes, just listen. Okay. Uh -huh. We need to get started. I will send you another Zoom link by email to you. We will play around okay. with your um, uh, slides and share screen all the format when Sudipta is presenting. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Oh, I may not be able to do the Zoom. Okay, that, that's not possible. I can send my Zoom mail, uh, link and we can do it through yeah, can you do that? my personal. Can you do that? Yeah. yeah, just I'm... did you email it? Uh, let's start the, the the seminars and after that uh, we'll com continue with Zoom. Okay, go ahead, get started, Magda. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Nice seeing you after the holidays uh, and uh, happy spring. And um, today we will have uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Sudipta Maiti and uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar. And um, I'm just uh, passing, uh, passing it to um, uh, Marty, Dr. Marty Zani to do the introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming and um, nice seeing you. Yes, well, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Sudipta Maiti to, um, to our audience today. Uh, Sudipta um, was a graduate student with Robin Hochstrasser at the University of Pennsylvania uh, a number of years ago. Um, back when he was a graduate student, he did some of the very early experiments on RF IR spectroscopy of various proteins. And in 1996, he went and did a postdoc with Watt Webb, a, a very successful postdoc, many publications. Uh, looking at uh, imaging of various sorts. Um, and that was highly regarded work over just a span of just about three years or so. Then he moved to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India, 
where he's been, where he's assembled a, a research pro, uh, program um, investigating neurotransmitter imaging. He does a lot of instrument development and of course, protein aggregation that he'll talk about today. So Dipta is very highly regarded in the community and I'm very happy uh, that he became a senior editor of the Journal of Physical Chemistry just a, a short time ago, uh, where he's provided much needed expertise on aggregation, of course, membranes and experimental biophysics overall. So Sadipta is gonna give a 30 minute talk um, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. If you have a question during his talk, please type it into the question and answer uh, um, um, part of Zoom and then I will read them and Sadipta will answer at the end. Sadipta, welcome. Hi Marty, that was a very nice surprise. Thanks for the introduction. And a special thanks to Rams uh, and also to Vikash for arranging this fantastic series of webinars and uh, for letting me have a chance to speak. So uh, for the past decade and a half, uh, we have been looking at toxic proteins, okay, toxic protein aggregates and toxic protein oligomers to be uh, exact uh, from our kind of viewpoint. There is of course a very broad problem. Many, many, many people including Rams, Hartley and many others work on this. And everybody has this favorite set of questions. Some of them are common and some of you may have heard of uh, those um, from the past speakers. But um, what we have, we like our questions and we believe those are the most important questions. So we'll put you through uh, six of the main things that we are uh, worried about. Uh, but before I go there, I will, okay, hold on. Before I go there, I will uh, tell you uh, what else we do. Of course, roughly half of the lab works on protein aggregation. I will come to that because that's what the talk is about. The other half is something that uh, Marty talked about. And so those people who work on these, I would not be mentioning their work. So it's one time, one chance for me to introduce them. Uh, we do work on neuronal signaling and some of the monoaminergic signaling, there are some fantastic results coming out. And um, we do work a lot on instrumentation, um, biophotonic uh, instrumentation development. We make microscopes. Uh, people actually have commercialized our microscopes, etc. And uh, our latest passion is small molecule, especially small neurotransmitter membrane interaction, which is uh, probably if you talk in the lab right now, everybody is talking about that. But our backbone for the last uh, decade and a half has been protein aggregation. And since I know I've run out of time, let me just thank the people who really do this work while I get to talk to all of you. And this is the team. And um, I've, you know, absolutely guaranteed this is some of the best uh, graduate students you could find in India. And uh, Vicky from the left, Ankur, Anup, Dev Shankar, Anirban, and Arpan. So those are the we have uh, in the Tata Institute. We have small groups. We have a couple of um, uh, you know, PDF or PDF level people uh, who are not here, but these are the six people who are really the backbone of the lab and absolutely dedicated and also fun to be with. But another thing is that um, the collaborators, of course, I have collaborators all over the world. For this part of the work, you can see already that list is long and this work wouldn't have been possible. This series of work wouldn't have been possible without any of them. And um, those in uh, bold are the people who are associated right now uh, in some of the work that we'll talk about. And uh, you know, it's good to have good collaborators who are good scientists. It's even more fun when those collaborators are close friends and each of them is uh, his name you see in both. Uh, so PK Madhu, my colleague in TIFR Hyderabad, uh, Solicitor Dinamar, Daniel Huster, Daniel is from Leipzig, Gilbert Walker uh, from University of Toronto, uh, Ravi Venkatramani, my colleague in TIFR, Kanchan Garai, my colleague, and uh, Aditi Mukherjee uh, from uh, Bangalore uh, in STEM. So some of the late work that I'll talk about, unpublished work with you with Kanchan and Aditi. Okay. So let me get to the uh, point. So here are the six questions I promised. So look at, you know, if you're thinking about protein aggregation, the first thing you think of is that, uh, what are the basic thermodynamic rules that um, sort of draw the boundary around the problem? And I come from the physics side, so this is the first thing I started thinking about. And when you talk about oligomers, which tend to be the, uh, suspected to be the most, uh, the key species for toxicity, you ask the question, what are the oligomers? Are they stable? Can I see an oligomer in a, you know, aggregating sugar solution or salt solution? And that question needs to be answered so that you understand what we're dealing with. So I'll start with that. 
Of course, if oligomers are important, then uh, being a biophysicist, you'll think, you'll bet that the structure has something to do with its function, which is toxicity. So you need to know the structure. And if oligomers are stable, it should be easy. If they're unstable, it's high. And uh, yeah, we'll, I'll tell you soon that it's high. Of course, with structure comes dynamics. So I like to uh, look at parts which are dynamic because frequently those are the parts which interact with other, um, other members of the cell and may cause toxicity. And uh, then as we'll come to the whole picture of one, two, three, we'll move to the membrane. Because turns out for uh, many of the protein oligomers, and at least for the two that I will talk about, I will talk interchangeably about amyloid beta, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease, and IAPP or amylin, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, those almost surely uh, work their uh, toxic effects through uh, their interaction with the membrane. So the whole problem now becomes a new set of problems. When you say talk about structure, what is the structure in the membrane? And um, finally, of course, you'll have to figure out, especially for Alzheimer's, all these one to five, do they have anything to do with neurons or actual Alzheimer's disease? This is a hard question. And uh, my uh, clinician friends think that we are all barking up the wrong tree, all biophysicists are barking up the wrong tree because whatever they find in the test tube has got nothing to do with uh, what they find in a patient brain. So our uh, last bit of work that we'll tell you about tries to bridge the gap and there are some surprises there. So let me start with one. Okay, the thermodynamics. Can uh, oligomers uh, be stable? Um, well, um, if we have to ask that question, you have to ask, you know, how do I understand aggregation at all? Um, you know, as I said, does it aggregate just like salt or sugar? Surprisingly, when we started, and this is the starting question I asked one of my friends who was asking, who was uh, working in this area, uh, the notion was that there is no well-defined uh, saturation concentration, unlike salt and sugar. Once aggregation starts, it just moves. And that was uh, something that they found difficult to believe, so I took up the challenge. And this is the first paper you'll see where it shows that it's actually there is thermodynamic solubility that you can define for every um, uh, aggregating peptide under every condition. Of course, you change the peptide, change the condition, the number changes. But there's a plot of, um, uh, look at the inset. The initial concentration of amyloid beta you put in, this is in PBS, 7.4 pH, and the fluorescence, the intrinsic fluorescence, say beta has a tyrosine, that you plot. So if you look at the initial concentration and the initial fluorescence, you'll see roughly it is concentration, uh, proportional concentration. You just wait and wait and wait, because that's the point. I'm not looking at the kinetics, I'm looking at thermodynamics. And they all become a flat line. That means they are all precipitating down to a certain concentration mm -hmm. and beyond which it is not precipitating down. You do a little bit of modeling, and I'm not going into the equations, you see very clearly where this curved line and the straight line meets, that's the saturation concentration. You can define it every time for a given temperature, a given solution condition, you'll get about for our thing, we'll get about 15 micromolar, which itself um, is a question that gets raised. I'll come to it because in the brain, it's a few nanometers. So I'll come to it. But let's come to the point, okay, if it's like salt and sugar, do I see uh, an oligomer in salt and sugar? Actually, you don't because that's very, very unstable. In this case, the oligomers are a little more stable, but still, ultimately, the oligomers are the intermediates between the large aggregates that precipitate and the small uh, monomers or maybe dimer trying to stay in the solution. You can do something called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, part of which we developed, part of which analysis we developed um, doing uh, maximum entropy method analysis that let us attack um, actually these problems uh, from uh, with protein aggregation. What you see on the right is the analysis of the raw data here is hydrodynamic radius in this axis and time of aggregation in that axis. And what we found very easily is that there is a population which is monomer, dimer, trimer, very small oligomers. And there is another population that separates out and starts aggregating, large, making larger and larger particles until it completely actually falls out. Okay? So you can clearly see uh, there are small oligomers, uh, large oligomers here. There are actually small oligomers in this edge. But ultimately, as I'll show in the next slide, all of that will precipitate. And this was sort of the ultimate point that we are trying to make, exactly to the same size, and they're all monomers. So if you wait long enough, no matter whether you start with 
100 micromolar, which is far above saturation concentration, or you start with 40 nanomolar, which is far below saturation concentration, it happens to be 15 micromolar under these conditions, you end up with the same hydrodynamic radius in the stuff that remains in the solution, which is important because given the time then, it is actually behaving just like salt and sugar. In between, of course, you have these complicated oligomeric structures, which will be our uh, of our interest for the rest of the talk. And we understand why they are quasi-stable. They're not ultimately stable. It's taken up a week and under precipitating conditions. There is um, a model, uh, and you can model their stability by saying that, okay, it's basically a competition between a short range attractive potential and the long range electrostatic um, uh, potential, which is actually uh, repulsive. And uh, you can easily model it change your um, ionic strength and see the relative size of stuff that becomes quasi-stable increase. So it actually lends itself. The, I'm not saying the absolute minute details, but the overall it lends itself to something that you can easily understand in terms of nucleation dependent aggregation model. Fair enough. Ultimately then, there is no um, oligomers left. So therefore, if you have to have oligomers anywhere, they must, have, must be on their way they could be off pathway oligomer, on pathway oligomers, off pathway oligomers will dissociate, on pathway oligomers will be on their way to the aggregate. So they would be transient species. That's important because if you are interested in oligomers, your challenge is to look at that transient species and try to get structure and hopefully atomic level structure, which I'll show you in a minute. So let me um, end this part of the talk. Um, so I mean, to every time we'll ask this question. So, so what do we uh, learn about how things are in the brain. So here is more confusing than, uh, you know, than clarifying. Uh, the brain actually has no business having any plaques. Of course it does. If every case that somebody sort of suffers for Alzheimer's, it has plaques. Because if you ask a clinician, he says, okay, the soluble concentration of amyloid beta is nanomolar, one, two, maybe sub-nanomolar. And at that concentration in nobody's test tube, at least given identifiable uh, buffer conditions, will you get any aggregation at all, okay? So there are, of course, possibilities. Um, so that's an elephant in the room, okay? One of these proteinopathy seminars, I'm forgetting the name, somebody raised that question, I loved it. And um, so the elephant in the room is, why does a beta aggregate at such low concentrations in the brain? Of course, there are possibilities. Your test tube is not the same as your brain. Um, there are interaction partners. But there are other, and there could be something like a prion hypothesis. Okay, these are the two possibilities that do exist. But there are other uh, possibilities, you know, seeds and all, they don't actually, uh, they, they, they are not something that will um, agree with the thermodynamic understanding. You can have a seed, but the seed will dissolve if you put it in nanomolar. We have done these experiments. Unless you say, okay, the monomers are now completely different, they are prion like. Yes, I haven't seen one prion in the test tube, but okay. I agree that there is a possibility, or there could be interaction partners. This part, interaction partners, I'll come to right at the end, because I think we have uh, some interesting news about that. Okay, so where do oligomers come from? As I said, they're continuously getting formed in the brain, because in the brain, you do see oligomers, dimers, trimers, small oligomers, and uh, people have shown that, um, you know, Dennis Selko and others have shown that they are probably the toxic species, and uh, they're on pathway uh, to aggregation, or off pathway, then they will dissolve. Okay, the one good news. So a thermodynamic approach is not all useless, even though it cannot answer the first question. One good news is that if they are intermediates, you can have a catalytic intervention. You see, when you make a drug or antibodies, which have been uh, things which have been tried, then you are trying to stop thermodynamics. It's like stopping the ultimate fate. Okay, you, things are downhill. You have to supply again and again more and more chemical potential in terms of more and more antibodies or whatever else you think can stop aggregation. But you have to supply free energy. But if they are intermediates which are toxic, you can just nudge the pathway towards aggregation. And suppose the aggregates are not toxic, and that can be catalyst. That's what catalysts do. So there is one good uh, understanding. If we can find a catalyst, we can probably do something about that. Okay, so. Uh, now coming on to the structure, so it's a transient species, and if it's interesting, we need to understand its structure. Otherwise, how do we design, let's say a catalyst if we want to design. So we looked at the structure. <laughs> if something evolves in the timescales of half an hour uh, to minutes to half an hour, 
then there is nothing um, that actually allows you to do a atomic level structure okay under solution conditions so what we decided okay <clears throat> fluorescence spectroscopy is exactly uh, good for this it's extremely sensitive and you can uh, slow down uh, aggregation etc by coming closer and closer to the saturation concentration and you can do fret of course you have to label the proteins etc all that is there but you we did the fret and tcspc the lifetime together for uh, looking at how uh, close they are coming and this is the only uh, graph that you need to pay attention to this is the distribution of distances coming from monomers okay sorry this arrow should have been uh, should have been on the black so black should be here and we now know how to produce monomers which most people in this business do not understand you have to get to monomer by going to extremely low concentrations and waiting for maybe a week or two then you get to this final 0.85 nanometer kind of hydrodynamic radius that's the monomer. so the monomers are of course have a very uh, uh, wide distribution they are not structured or very partially structured they're open uh, things and you have a 50 angstrom kind of um, uh, distance between average distance between the, the interesting thing is that when they form oligomers at once there is a structural change you see this sorry my cursor ah, you see this peak comes up this was what it was some monomers of course remain so in everything you'll see this but this peak comes up you become large oligomers i showed you the distribution in the past uh, one of the previous slides this becomes large oligomers this becomes a fibrils and, you know each of these you see that there is a short distance, which is the compact structure, which is forming fibrils, and there is a distance distribution, which is some monomers which are staying in the solution. We initially thought, and this is now uh, what, 2010 or 2011, we initially thought that this is all the same. Okay, small oligomers, large oligomers, they are the same peak around 20 angstroms, and we have understood, tracked the problem. But it also tells me that if that's all the same, then the oligomer should have no business being uh, in the toxicity shouldn't be very different from the uh, fibers. So we are wrong in this interpretation. And uh, actually, you can see the hint of that right here. The oligomers actually are closer than the uh, fibers. Of course, given the um, resolution of threat, I won't claim much here, but the hint was already there. Okay, so we needed to do atomic level uh, things. We knew it. And this is where we scratched our head for almost a year or so and came up with this. So if we can see the aggregation process, follow it, look at when things come together. There are different times at which different transitions happen, as I showed you in the last one, last slide. Then I can stop it by freezing, flash freeze it, and I put it in liquid ethane or something. We did liquid nitrogen, but it works. And you do solid state energy because you need atomic level things and uh, FET is not going to be able to tell you uh, to that level because the level itself is uh, many angstroms, uh, rhodamine or something, whatever you put. Uh, so here is our idea and we took help from uh, PK Madhu and later on, of course, also Daniel, I joined in, Daniel Hoster. And uh, we, this is with uh, the Madhu and we did this combination of fluorescence and NMR, uh, solid state NMR study, you freeze it and you keep it um, uh, dry and frozen and do the solid state MR. And you get this difference. And you let part of that same solution go to uh, fibrils. So you do that and compare the uh, chemical shifts. OK, do 2D NMR and compare the chemical shifts. Of course, these are C13 and 15 labels, et cetera. And you look at the bottom, um, OK, look at the bottom yellow uh, panel in the middle. OK, my cursor is disappearing. Yeah. So this is a beta one to a beta 40. Most of our experiments with a beta 40. You see, this is uh, up to about uh, 10. This is up to about 20. This is 30 and this is 40. So up zero to nine or zero to 10, you have, a, this is the delta delta, which is the chemical shape difference between the oligomer and the fibers. Because you are asking the question, uh, why are the oligomers different in toxicity from the fibers? And you see, there is a large amount of uh, difference in the chemical shapes. In this region, there is not much. Most of them are within the resolution of uh, solid state NMR. Again, there's this turn region. There's a region in which the, uh, the uh, strand turns from D23 to K28. And there's again a dispersion and again um, a difference between the uh, solid state NMR of oligomers and fibrils. And again, in the C terminal end, they're same. So there are two regions which are very different between the oligomer and the fibril. That's the basic thing. 
And we are delighted to see that almost all the mutations that are known to cause, again, I'm coming to the clinical side, known to cause early onset Alzheimer's fall either in this region, where in the N terminus or in the term region. Okay, so that's uh, that tells you something, except you don't know exactly what it tells. So, Dipta, Seems let me like interrupt. So, Dipta, let me interrupt for a minute and, and just say you have about ten minutes until question and answer time. Okay, good. I'll go quicker. And you see a F nineteen L thirty four connection that turns out to be very important. And we were we developed this technique. We are on it for the next three years, and we developed it and we. Um, understood the structural evolution, uh, residue by residue, uh, angstrom by angstrom, and we found out something very important, which is oligomers are anti -caramel. You'd say, okay, didn't we know that before? No, we didn't. Okay, there were data from people who did it with um, antibody uh, attachments or from Jim, my friend Jen Snowy, who um, has beautiful extra structure, but those are not natural amyloid data in solution. So we did this with, using this technique, and you do radar spectroscopy, you see the intramolecular distance uh, becomes usually is about 10 angstroms, but in the fibrils, it's five angstroms. Uh, sorry, in the oligomers, it's five angstroms, which shows that the oligomers are anti caramel beta shape. And the Raman actually, actually uh, establishes that. So, why is that important? So, now I, I, I leave the oligomer structure part of it. But the one point you should remember. If you're thinking about oligomers in the membrane, which I'm coming to right now, only toxic structure we know, which is beta sheet, is actually anti-parallel beta sheet. Is that um, corians? So if they have to be structured uh, like corians, then um, they have to be anti-parallel beta sheets, and the fibrils are not anti-parallel. Okay, I will actually leave out the dynamics part. I'm running out of time. Uh, there is a part which you can do very fast um, FCS, and you can actually. Um, uh, we have developed techniques to, oh, sorry, uh, to look at uh, how the interactions between a drug molecule and uh, something else, uh, the dynamic part happens. Let me come to oligomer membrane interaction, okay? And let me just turn off. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I forgot to turn off my mobile, but now it's uh, me ring again. It's, so come to the uh, meat of it. So only the oligomer, and this is where the things start getting interesting, attaches to the membrane. The only the oligomer ha that has that conformation attaches to the membrane. Here is a, uh, an FCS study that we saw monomers and oligomers, only the oligomers attach. So you're on to something here. If attachment to membrane has anything to do with toxicity, we understand that this is the structure that can attach. The monomers cannot attach, which at once tells you why the monomers are non-toxic. But it could be just oligomers, right? Is it structure specific? Exquisitely so. If you take out that F19 L34 and perturb it just by a stereo isomer, okay? The F phenylalanine here, you take the D phenylalanine so that it points the other way, the whole um, activity stops. It drastically reduces its membrane binding. And um, together with Daniel, uh, we later showed that it also reduces toxicity when Daniel changed the leucine to isoleucine to valine, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Anything you do with that connection that uh, changes toxicity and uh, cell attachment. So tells you that the specific conformation that uh, uh, at least if you translate toxicity into membrane attachment, specific conformation matters. So I, as I said, if you have a catalyst which can change the folding pathway or aggregation pathway, from F19 L34 junction to something else in probably. So then we needed to know the structure in the membrane. So we already know it's anti-parallel in the solution, but you know that doesn't matter. The membrane is a very different beast. So when it inserts, if it inserts at all, does it remain anti-parallel like a, a better barrel? Does it change? Uh, what happens? So these are the questions we ask. Does it have a particular structure at all in the membrane? Is it an anti-parallel? Is there a particular orientation up, down, sideways? Because if you think it's a, an ion channel, that's how it becomes toxic, then it better have some standard kind of configuration and not be random all over. Do they have a particular placement? Uh, how deep do they go? And do they have a particular stoichiometry? All of these we solved. I'm sorry, we don't have time to talk too much about it, but uh, we again went to develop some techniques, which is called, um, we worked with Gilbert, uh, lipid-coated nanoparticles, and we developed something, uh, some instruments in our lab, 
uh, which could do all these experiments, Raman experiments, and we know, and together with, again, solid state and MR. So those are the sort of the gold standard kind of things. You find something, you, um, uh, you test it with solid state and MR, and we know that they are anti-parallel in the membrane, okay? And we know that they have a particular placement. There's a yet, yet another technique we develop. Uh, you have a nanoparticle, you wrap it with a lipid bilayer, the A beta comes and spontaneously sits there. You have different parts labeled with fluorophores. And if the fluorophore is close to the uh, nanoparticle inside, that is, it goes deep inside, the fluorescence is quenched. If it's hanging outside, the fluorescence is not quenched. And what this, um, this tells you is just uh, lifetime measurements. It tells you that the N terminal is towards the outside, C terminal is towards the inside. If you present a vesicle to the amyloid beta, and on an average, therefore, it is a particular orientation. It doesn't even go like this and that. It always goes like this, on an average at least. And it doesn't go sideways. Okay, most it is. So it sort of ticks all the boxes for being uh, a possible ion channel candidate, which other people have shown that it may be working like that. But the structure and that function relationship was not there. It better have a particular stoichiometry. We developed single molecule techniques. I didn't find a very particular stoichiometry, but it's roughly two, three, four. But single molecule techniques have this slight, uh, this thing due to photo bleaching. So it could have a little narrower distribution that you see here. The stoichiometry of the oligomers and their relative affinity for the membrane. And we know that dimers, trimers, and tetramers are very high. Okay, let me have at least, hopefully I have five minutes, come to the uh, part that is unpublished. <coughs> well, first part is published. What about neurons? All that I have talked about till now is in test tube or you know, some are in cells, toxicity measurements, not real uh, neurons. Mm -hmm. So we had some idea a couple of years ago um, asking, mm -hmm. you know, all this that you understood in the test tube, uh, is it true also in the in a neuron or does uh, the neuron do something to a beta? Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about a possible interaction part. It turns out in the neuron and um, Actually, the N terminal is extremely important, okay? If you look at the left, the toxicity is the highest for the full length. The moment you have a, a C terminal fragment, which is just nine residues taken away, and those are the dynamic part of it, which I didn't describe the dynamics experiment, it becomes almost completely non-toxic, just like the function. You take only the N terminal, that also is non-toxic, so they have to be together. You take uh, if a funny DL, DL alternate, just of the nine residues of the N-terminal is still mostly non-toxic. So the N-terminal seems to have some role to play and probably has some interaction. And we did uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging and you see the distribution of lifetime here. We found that for wild time, rhodamine labeled near the N-terminus, you do have a very, sh I mean, a rather short lifetime component to the A beta that goes in. There's flame, so the A beta is inside these rat neurons. Anything else you do, you take out the first nine, it's not there. You take out, uh, you have the full thing, but you scramble the L and D in the N terminus, it's not quite there. There is some funny things, but it's not quite that short component. You put the rhodamine in the C terminal, it's not there at all. And you take out some other parts, it's also not. So the point is uh, N terminal seems to have an interaction. Yep. One, one minute? One, one, or, one or two okay. minutes, yeah. So what's that got to do with Alzheimer's? Well, Alzheimer's patient, uh, so we got, finally you need to do experiments with Alzheimer's neurons and using iPSCs, um, uh, my collaborator, Aditi Mukherjee, develops uh, uh, neurons uh, from humans, from patients whose genetic history is known, those are patients who are alive. So we found out, we knew what we were going to look for, the lifetime of, Artificial A beta, rhodamine label, put in. And we saw the same thing that we saw before. The, the biggest surprise here is that if it came from the patient, it had, and it had, the patient had an APOE4, it had a very uh, distinct short lifetime component. If it came from the control, it didn't have that much of a short lifetime component, okay? And this is APOE34, if you separately put in uh, APOE34, I won't go into artificially put in APOE34. This is asking the question, the end terminal is interacting with something which is bearing the signature of the disease. You put APOE4 from the outside, you recover the short component. 
doesn't prove it's only FOE4, but I think we are onto something and we can actually tell you that we have a direct relationship between our structural understanding and the real disease. Because it seems that you just give me uh, some blood cells from which I'll make neurons and do these incubations, I will be able to tell you whether the guy is suffering from Alzheimer's or not. So something there retains the signature. So I have answered all these questions, so I don't have time to recollect all these. So I stop here and let one. Sorry. Mr. Great. Thank you, Sadipta. I will clap on the behalf of all the participants. Very nicely done. Um, let's see. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A section of uh, Zoom. Um, there's three questions of so far. We'll answer questions for uh, approximately 10 minutes. And then um, if you stay to the very end of the talks, we'll have an open question answer session again. Um, so the first question comes from Raghu. Molecular crowding effects facilitate nanomolar level of A beta peptide aggregation in the brain, question mark. Uh, fair enough, but we have tried some molecular aggregation of phycol and all, and um, uh, sorry, uh, even sucrose and all. It doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. You see 15 micromolar, 1.5 nanomolar. So that's four orders of magnitude. And usually it's, these are excluded volume effects, and you're not going to get four orders of magnitude. That's a short answer. All right. That but makes... yes, can contribute, mm -hmm. definitely. Right, it counts for some of it, but not all. Okay, someone, not an anonymous person posted the question. From NMR studies, we know that A beta 1 to 40 remains in solution for at least several weeks at concentrations much higher than the saturation concentration that you mentioned. Can you please explain the discrepancy? Absolutely. So it depends a little bit on your uh, buffer conditions. But yes, a couple of weeks, it remains even in PBS. So as I said, uh, there's a thermodynamic question, okay? You can, after a couple of weeks, in typical PBS, you spin it down lightly, 2000 G for say half an hour, and then you do your NMR and you'll see what remains. Only the uh, monomers will remain. And if your NMR is good enough to pick up signal from about 15 micromolar, you'll see a signal. If not, you won't see a signal. Guaranteed. Yeah. I mean, look through the literature. Also the first one, but many people in, <laughs> they call it critical concentrations, whatever it is. <clears throat> but in PBS, a beta 40 is 15 micromolar, roughly. You will take a couple of micromolar. For a beta 42, it will be three or four micromolar. But they are defined. Um, another question from Giuseppe. What spectrum is the F19 L34 peak coming from? That's the 13C, 13C correlation spectrum. All right. There's been a couple of comments here on uh, Skimming over real quick. Is there any report of increased localized concentration of A-beta near membrane or inside membrane-bound vesicles, which could stabilize and, and accelerate aggregation? That's a very good question. Uh, membrane, of course, is a 2D surface. So if you look at the free energy of aggregation, it's actually lower. That The energy barrier for inflation-dependent aggregation is actually lower. You can have a very different quote unquote solubility in the membrane, which may be lower. So if you're just talking about aggregation happening in the membrane phase, yes, it could be much lower. But what people think is that it nucleates in the membrane and then the aggregates uh, go out into the extracellular medium, then again, it should start dissolving because the membrane cannot provide that much free energy. So yes, if you're talking about aggregation in the membrane, it can be very different. But nucleated by membrane, it cannot. But the other question is, right? If you do have membrane-bound vesicles which have very high concentrations, fair enough, yes, it can aggregate. But the moment it comes out, like in a plaque in the brain, it's uh, open to the cerebrospinal fluid, it should start dissolving. It doesn't, I'm not saying it does, but I'm saying by all the understanding we have, if it's pure A-beta, you know, answer is it's not pure A-beta. There are other uh, constituents of it. And, we should focus on those constituents which make the solubility of A beta much lower. We tried uh, cerebrospinal fluid drawing from the rat and tried doing this experiments. It seems to have drawn cerebrospinal fluid. It seems to have same or similar solubility, give or take a factor of two compared to PBS. But yes, in a real brain, there could be other things. All right, so that's good. Let me move on to the next question. 
comes from Sheena Radford, who congratulates you on a nice talk. And then she asks, regarding the anti-parallel oligomers, are they on or off pathway? I.e., how do they convert to the from the parallel to the from the parallel in register structure? Sorry, how do they convert into the parallel in register structure of the fibrils? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we don't know the answer to that. And I think the only way we can find out is uh, through MD simulations. And my friend uh, Ravi Venkatramani is trying to see that. It will take a very, very long uh, uh, simulation. We can catch them, but we always catch them as a part uh, population which is parallel and part population which is anti parallel. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, we don't have answer to that question. I have okay. a feeling it will be off partly, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then another question is uh, please say more about ensuring monomers. Is it not possible to obtain monomers by sedimenting oligomers in fibrils? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. But ultimately, the monomers will be only at the concentration of solubility. And you have to really go long, long, long time. As I said, somebody else also said, it easily is a couple of weeks. You know, it's a slow process towards the end. And then you precipitate it out, then you'll be left with monomers. Uh, but uh, you'll be left with some low concentration of monomers. Um, and then another uh, question. How do you rule out F19, L34 contact being intramolecular or intermolecular? Very good question. So uh, the answer is easy. And in that paper, it's there. You, uh, these are C13, N15 labeled peptides. So you do uh, partial uh, dilution with unlabeled peptide. And you see uh, that they're intramolecular. Good. I had uh, just uh, one quick question regarding your solubility experiments. Have, did you ever try to measure the supercritical concentration of ligamers separate from the from the fibrils? So, uh, Marty, it depends on how you prepare the solution. Again, in the supercritical, therefore, it is not stable. And um, I think there, all hell breaks loose because they change the condition a little bit. Somebody, some people add HFIP, some people add something else, and it's anybody's game. And you may have something that is... Um, Quasi stable, as I showed that a little bit of change of ionic concentration, ionic strength will change the stability and all. So it becomes a tough question. You have, so better is to stick to one protocol and know what you can. But you can stabilize, quasi stabilize them uh, to some extent. Good. Okay, final question comes from David Eisenberg. What is the stoichiometry of the oligomers? How many molecules? The answer is about. The after, uh, so the molygomers, so okay, so it's three or four, okay, roughly, there is a distribution, and that I'll define it, I'll define it, say you have an oligomeric uh, solution, which has anything up to 10, 12 um, mers, and you can see that by FCS, then you let it attach to a membrane, in this case, we did artificial membranes, and then you do a single molecule photo bleaching experiment and ask which one's attached, and you see that is three, four, uh, is the mostly what is attaching. However, single molecule experiments have a little tough time with larger um, oligomers. So it's, I won't say it's a very clean answer, but uh, I would be surprised it's very different from some peak, some distribution. It's not a single thing for sure. Uh, so very far your, off. Your, it could your be photo bleaching experiments are super clear, right? Showing that you have threes and fours, right? But uh, I guess that is, in essence, maybe a lower limit because the data gets, uh, it's harder to see the steps if, if right. larger ones do exist. Is that right? Yeah, statistically, we do look at it. Um, you know, if things look exponential, obviously, they're very large things. And we do put some up to eight to account and we do greater than eight and do the whole population. We don't neglect any spot and that's low. But okay. um, there'll be some of that. All right. Well, Sudipta, let me thank you once again on behalf of everyone attending. That's a really, I love it, very super active question and answer session. And I am handing it back over to Magda. Thanks a lot, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Sunil, do you mind starting your presentation? Uh, and um, let's see, screen two. Oh. Hopefully it works this time. Can you see the screen? 
Yes, perfect. Okay. So we are nice. Yeah, we are ready to go. Thank you. So I, I will start with a short introduction. Um, uh, Dr. Sumil um, Kumar received his uh, PhD in chemistry uh, in uh, Clemson University with uh, supervisor Dr. Daf uh, Aria. And uh, during his PhD, uh, he worked on the recognition of nucleic acids using amino sugars. And he did two postdocs. Uh, his po first postdoc was in Yale with uh, Dr. Miranker. And the second one was in NYU uh, with Dr. Uh, Hamilton. And um, this is where he uh, switched fields and he started working on uh, protein aggregation and uh, studying the the properties why the amyloids are uh, why proteins are assembling into amyloids, and two years ago, uh, he joined University of the in Denver and um, uh, to start his own lab, and he's gonna talk about his most um, recent findings. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, just uh, to remind you, the talk is uh, 30 minutes, followed with uh, 10 minutes of uh, questions. And after that, we'll, we'll all continue with questions for the two speakers. Um, thank you. It's your turn now. Thanks. OK, thanks, Magda. Can you guys hear me clearly and see the slides? Hello? Yes. OK, great. So uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Rams and Magda for putting together this podium. Like It was really nice to see a lot of uh, uh, great talks. I learned a lot, actually. And uh, hopefully, it's going to go for a while. And uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'll just contribute uh, my part uh, by talking about our work, which we've been doing uh, in our lab in last one year. So we have two projects, but I'm going to just talk about this one. So uh, I changed the title as well a bit. It's uh, now, uh, but the theme is same. Uh, we are using these uh, distinct class of molecules called foldamers uh, to get some structural and therapeutic insights into uh, uh, various nucleopathies. And uh, one of them, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, I guess most of you are aware in this audience. And that is the center uh, uh, of the, one of the main central uh, element uh, in nucleopathies is the aggregation of a protein called alpha synuclein and uh, i'm gonna straight away jump on it alpha synuclein protein get expressed abundantly in uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, in substantia nigra in the brain and one of couple of its functions one of them is uh, it regulate the recycling and uh, uh, re and trafficking of these uh, synaptic vesicles which are filled with dopamine so it helps in uh, the neurotransmitter which is dopamine release However, under certain circumstances, which are sporadic or familial, uh, it leads to uh, a genetic mutation or post-translation mod modifications in this protein. It start uh, uh, aggregating, uh, which are either oligomers or uh, the fibers. I, I hope you can see my cursor as well. Uh, so uh, please let me know if you can't. Otherwise, then I'll switch to laser. So they form these oligomers. And what it does is uh, uh, it creates these uh, initial uh, Parkinson's disease phenotypes, which are uh, uh, because of the deplete pool of these uh, synaptic vesicles, which are filled with dopamine. And uh, also then there is a uh, less release of uh, the uh, neurotransmitter, which is uh, uh, dopamine. Now, uh, that lead to uh, early symptoms of uh, uh, um, the Parkinson's disease, as you can see, some of them are uh, imbalance in speech, walk, trembling, rigidity, stooped posture. So these are some of the symptoms. And then in later stage, some of the patients, they develop a, a mild dementia as well. So it has been suggested in, in last few years that one of the main strategies uh, uh, is the modulation therapeutic uh, strategy is modulation of these structures, which are oligomers and, and fibers. And uh, to, to do that, uh, first I'll just uh, take you guys towards the uh, understanding the structural features of this whole pathway. 
So uh, there are a few structures which has been known of alpha synuclein. As you can see, one of them is the membrane bound functional state or helical structure. Uh, there is another structure, which is this uh, uh, tetrameric uh, uh, structure of uh, alpha synuclein uh, has been uh, proposed and shown. And then during this aggregation, I call it uh, aberrant protein protein interaction. Uh, and they are mediated through these uh, uh, helical uh, helical interactions. And uh, I guess uh, maybe Samir uh, Mazi, if he's in crowd professor, he uh, has shown in one of his paper, and there are other papers where there's a formation of these intermediate helical structure has been proposed and shown. Uh, so now what we are proposing is we are using these uh, full dumber based approach uh, to disrupt uh, these interactions. And uh, as you can see, full dumber molecules, they are uh, uh, mimics of uh, proteins uh, in terms of their topography, as well as the spatiotemporal arrangement of these uh, side chains. As you can see here, this is just a representation, these side chains of the helical structure and we can complement them using a synthetic strategy uh, and uh, then uh, to disrupt this, this interaction. Now, there is another scaffold. It's called oligoquinolin. They are literally three-dimensional uh, structures with a with spiral uh, shape. Uh, another thing uh, with these, just to give a uh, background on these fold dumbers from a therapeutic perspective, that uh, they fall within this uh, range of... Uh, a molecular weight uh, between small molecules and proteins, whether they are Fe body or larger proteins. And also, uh, they are best of both the worlds in terms of uh, their molecular weight is more closer to small molecule. And uh, the second thing is they can mimic the protein structures. Uh, you could uh, manipulate, uh, tune these side chains, which are shown here with uh, arrows, uh, without disturbing their fold which is very uh, difficult to do with the uh, proteins or peptides, especially for smaller peptides. And uh, these oligoquinonium scaffold uh, has been shown to disrupt uh, or modulate the uh, various amyloid proteins so far. These are a few citations, as you can see. One is IAPPI late amyloid polypeptide, which is associated with a uh, type 2 diabetes, and the other one is a A-beta peptide, which is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, they have been very effective in order to uh, manipulate the aggregation profile of uh, these amyloid proteins. So we then set forth to test them, a library of these molecules, for uh, to check the their effect on the aggregation profile of alpha synuclein. And uh, to do that, I guess, I don't need to repeat what a THT assay is, but if you don't know, uh, it quantifies the amount of fibers in the solution. It's a dye which intercalates in the fibers. And you can see you always get in amyloid proteins generally a sigmoidal profile uh, where the whole protein converted into fibers here. Now, this is a very generic uh, 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 assay to screen a library of ligands against uh, amyloid proteins. And we tested it and we got this one ligand, which is a uh, uh, dianionic uh, with a hydrophobic uh, character, as you can see here. Uh, there are two anions and then a hydrophobic character. We also validated these results with these uh, negatively stained TEM. As you can see, a lot of fibers, there are no fibers. Now, what we did is then uh, we used to get the affinity of this molecule against alpha synuclein, we used a fluorescence polarization assay where we uh, connected a um, synthetically connected a fluorescine dye and uh, we got an affinity of less than one micromolar. Now, if you uh, don't know how fluorescence polarization works, it's uh, uh, we titrate the protein in this uh, with this molecule, and uh, the big, larger the size formation, uh, it we ex we plot it again, plot it against the the concentration, and you get the uh, this curve, and then we fit it to get the the affinity. Now, we also tested the specificity of this molecule uh, against uh, uh, various amyloid proteins. I'm gonna show it just here, A-beta. You can see there is no uh, difference in the aggregation profile. Also, uh, using this assay, uh, uh, using this molecule, uh, which was pretty neat to see that uh, there was a 15-fold uh, difference in the affinity. Uh, so A-beta affinity, as you can see, more than 10 micromolar. Uh, so it was very specific towards the alpha synuclein.
Now we moved forward to um, measure the uh, the effect of this molecule on uh, in cellular uh, uh, media. Uh, I mean, uh, in cells. And we used these SHSY cells, which are uh, neuroblastoma cells, using a very standard MTT assay, which uh, measures the uh, cell viability, uh, using 10 micromolar of this uh, protein in absence and presence of uh, substoichiometry and equimolar concentrations of the molecule. And you can clearly see here the cell viability. Uh, the protein was toxic. But even at substoichiometric concentrations, uh, it was the molecule was very good in order to rescue the toxicity. And also, the molecule didn't have any inherent uh, uh, toxicity as well. Other property of this molecule, given that it's a dynamic, uh, it has dynamic nature. It has a very good cell permeability. So we tested it through two ways. One is uh, we used a. a, a the same fluorescent analog, and uh, in, within 12 hours, it was completely internalized in the SHSY cells. The other one is we used a, a kit called uh, another method called PEMPA uh, assay, uh, which is a very generic method to measure the uh, uh, cell permeability of various ligands. And you can see it comes with a kit. There are three standards here. So our molecule has equal, if not better, uh, cell permeability than their medium standard. So now we have two properties of this molecule. It permeates membrane and uh, it uh, inhibit aggregation and it's specific for alpha-synuclein. So then we move forward with an in vivo assay and used a C. elegans based uh, assay where uh, there's a, uh, and C. elegans has been used abundantly for aging uh, uh, diseases. And uh, one of them is this strain NL5901 in which uh, the, Synuclein yellow fluorescent protein is genetically incorporated in the muscle cells. And uh, the idea is adds these, uh, uh, these worms, they grow older uh, from larva stage to adulthood. They uh, get more aggregates and then uh, that impair their uh, uh, locomotion and then they die premature. So generally their span is from 15 to 20 days, depending on what strain you're talking about. Now, hopefully, uh, my uh, video work here, uh, let's see, yesterday didn't. So uh, you can see here, uh, there are these, this is just one representative example of a uh, C. elegans PD model. You can see a lot of strains, and it's a 3D model. So you are seeing fading and increase of more uh, C. elegans, uh, uh, these, uh, um, um, these inclusions, which are a representation of synuclein YFP inclusions. And in the present, so we gave it two doses, a uh, burst of this molecule at L1 and L4 stage. And you can clearly see uh, there were significantly less number of uh, inclusions uh, within the presence of this molecule. Also, it, they were statistically significant, as you can see, difference from 34 uh, uh, inclusions around to nine inclusions. So now this was one PD phenotype in these uh, models. The other PD uh, phenotype was their locomotion. So we also uh, checked that using uh, this uh, relatively newer model from uh, in vivo biosystems. Earlier it was NEMA matrix. Uh, so it, what it does is just to give you quickly a brief introduction of that. You can have a 96 well plate or a 24 well or six well plate. And uh, you can uh, have equal number of these worms uh, in absence and presence of this molecule. And uh, then uh, uh, there is a IR beam. So higher the uh, motion of the uh, these uh, uh, worms, the, the more times the IR beam get interrupted and that converts into their locomotion or relativity, uh, relative activity uh, counts. So you can clearly see here, these are just the just to give you a representation they are very slow and uh, these are uh, rather uh, faster with the molecules this is how uh, the beam works it it measures their local and then we obviously did the uh, uh, for a number of days we uh, monitored them and uh, it was a very rigorous experiment actually or less more than four times in, in duplicate. So it was a statistically significant difference. And uh, you can see the blue is just the, uh, these worms with the PD. And then uh, uh, with the molecule, you can see clearly there was a, 
a significant uh, difference in the activity and we compared it with n2 which is a uh, uh, which is a control uh, bristol uh, uh, strain which has no aggregation in that now i'm going to switch gears a bit about uh, so far we have the molecule which uh, even in vivo showing great activity and uh, now the, the next question is where the molecule is binding on the uh, on the protein so uh, bef before that i'll just take you to uh, uh, the binding interaction of alpha synuclein and it has been shown that uh, the n terminal of alpha synuclein which is somewhere from 1 to 90 95 amino acids is very important for aggregation as you can see that was from uh, 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 Chris Dobson's lab, the paper where they have the membrane and then initially it interacts on it and then it uh, aggregates and form these fibers. The other paper which came out uh, last year from a uh, um, great paper, I really liked it, from Sebastian uh, Hiller lab, where they showed that chaperones, they interact with the end terminal of alpha synuclein and regulate the aggregation and function of alpha synuclein. So N terminus is very important for the aggregation. That was the whole idea behind the slide. Now, if our molecule is that effective, there is a possibility that it's binding towards the end terminal. And so to, to validate it, we did a 2D NMR. So uh, it's HSQC NMR, pretty common, where we have two resonances uh, on the C term, uh, sorry, the uh, N term, uh, the one resonance is N15, the other one is hydrogen. So we isotopically labeled alpha synuclein, and then uh, we added one is to one equivalent of the molecule, as you can see the, the orange. The idea is, uh, every peak here represents the backbone uh, interaction with a side chain attached. So if there are 140 residues, there will be so many peaks of the backbone. Now, when you add the molecule, uh, wherever the molecule is binding, it will uh, influence the chemical environment there. And uh, that could lead to either change in the chemical shift or the intensity. So we picked the intensity and extracted the data and we got a uh, four binding sites of this molecule. What, the other thing is it's predominantly binding on the N terminus. You can see there was hardly any change in the intensity on the C terminus. Now, another thing we wanted to do is uh, to see if there is a structural change induced by this molecule uh, after binding to alpha synuclein. So uh, what, what we did is we uh, matched it with the uh, alpha synuclein when it interact with the uh, uh, LUVs. And it's been known that when it interacts with uh, LUVs, they interact on the end terminus. So this is with the, alpha with the molecule at a little bit higher concentration to equivalent. And you can clearly see they are very similar. So uh, we propose that the molecule is inducing an alpha helical conformation in, in the uh, protein. Uh, we also validated it with a CD. So this is this CD is just uh, the protein in absence. And uh, so for 100 hours, you can see clearly a beta sheet aggregates. But in presence of the molecule, it converts into these helical structure. And so there are two pr uh, uh, proposed mechanisms. One is it inducing a helical conformation and sequestering it. The other one is uh, uh, as some of the papers have shown that uh, the aggregation of uh, alpha synuclein, the intermediates, they are helically rich. So the other uh, proposed mechanism is that a molecule is uh, binding to the, um, the helical intermediates and uh, capturing them, sequestering them, stabilizing them, and populating them so that it won't move forward to the aggregate. Uh, now, we compared it with, as I said, there was this uh, great paper came out uh, uh, from Sebastian Hiller lab uh, last year uh, about chaperone. So we also uh, compared our results, the binding site with, uh, this is a uh, picture is from uh, their paper, and it's very common binding site. They call it canonical motive, uh, chaperone motive. You can clearly see the, the binding interactions when we matched with ours, they are almost carbon copy, uh, which suggests that our molecule and chaperones, they are binding on the same uh, domain or uh, sequence. And uh, they showed that uh, how the, the mode of action of uh, intracellularly of chaperones is, this is the monomer uh, of alpha synuclein. And to avoid, this is the pathology, uh, sorry, functional side, and this is pathological side. So on the functional side, the molecule so the, the chaperone, it binds with the N-terminus and stabilizes it 
uh, and then it uh, regulate its function and also its aggregation. It will never allow it to go to this pathological side. So that's what we thought that our molecule is interacting with the uh, with this uh, uh, N-terminus and uh, uh, pretty much similar interactions as a chaperone and uh, uh, allowing it to regulate the, the aggregation of alpha, alpha synuclein. Now, uh, as I showed, uh, the molecule is binding to these four sites. We wanted to see if, uh, uh, we, we thought that if these four sites, if the molecule is capping them or binding with them, uh, maybe these four sites are important for aggregation. And we got a lot of inspiration from uh, uh, one paper from Professor Sina Redford's lab, which came out and while we were working at the same time. So what we did is we uh, did a mutation study. And- uh, Sunil, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, huh? Your cursor is not visible if you can uh, try to upload it again. And you have about 12 more minutes remaining. Okay, uh, cursor is not visible. So can you see it now, the laser? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, it's 12 minutes, yeah, that should be plenty. Okay, <laughs> so what we did is we did this mutation study and uh, we uh, systematically removed all these different sites uh, from alpha synuclein. And then initially to validate if, if uh, our molecules binding sites are correct, we did this uh, 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 polarization assay. And clearly, if you see these two uh, domains, these two, when you remove them, the binding decreases significantly, uh, like in comparison, tenfold less than the wild type. So clearly they are the main binding sites. And then we also see a decrease in binding with these two sequences, which are here. So we're proposing that these binding sites may be the secondary uh, in comparison to the primary binding site. So now we got that, we know that our molecule is binding there. Uh, what's we also wanted to see if these binding sites are important or these domain uh, sequences are important for aggregation. So what we did is we did uh, uh, alpha, uh, the THT aggregation and you can see if you pay attention towards these, uh, uh, just the uh, sequences by themselves, the mutant, these three, they aggregated even though there were the aggregation slowed down as almost three, four fold. Here, these two sequences, they did not aggregate at all. And uh, we validated it with, you can see, with the TEM. Uh, after this, we see some kind of amorphous aggregates, uh, but uh, and which are THT sensitive, but here we did not see uh, anything. Uh, so, uh, which suggests that these are really the uh, main uh, aggregation sites which are important and probably now targets, you know. We also did CD uh, to uh, validate these results. So you can clearly see there are beta sheet, beta sheet, you did not, we did not see any structure here. This was uh, for us a little puzzling that we see it's THT sensitive, uh, the sequence. However, uh, we did not see a beta sheet structure here. So these structures are THT sensitive, but may not be beta, uh, uh, beta sheet. So we don't know the answer for that. Now in the last section, I'm gonna switch gears a bit more. Uh, then we wanted to see if these molecules are, uh, these sites are important for a uh, seed catalyzer aggregation. So uh, uh, if you just give you a quickly overview of seed catalyzer uh, aggregation, then so far we have studied is the primary nucleation. You can have, these are seeds and monomers, they convert into initial seed and then they propagate the aggregation. However, if there are secondary nucleation or elongation, you already have the seeds and then they take the fresh protein and uh, quickly, significantly quickly uh, increase the, uh, the aggregation. As you can see here, uh, the preformed fibers, when you add to alpha synuclein, uh, you uh, lose the uh, lag phase. Now, the implication of this, uh, this assay is in uh, uh, neurons where the, where the uh, seeds, they can translocate from one neuron to other and uh, uh, in fact, or template the fresh functional monomeric alpha synuclein. Uh, and that behavior of them, these uh, uh, seeds are, is called prion-like spread. It's like a perfect analogy with a, uh, a virus. They go from one host cell and then they, uh, 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 they make a lot of viruses. They're infected and jump to another one. So that's how I see it. Now, uh, 
it, its implication in the uh, in the prion-like spread, uh, which is another form of toxicity in PD. So we checked if these sequences are important for that, uh, for in in uh, inducing the templated aggregation, and we saw similar pattern. Uh, so I just want to point out these that there are the comparison of this is the uh, primary nucleation, all of them. This is secondary nucleation, and you can clearly see that uh, uh, there is a enhanced uh, uh, aggregation or uh, uh, acceleration of aggregation in all these three cases. However, we did not see these uh, uh, converting to any aggregate through the seed catalyzed aggregation as well. We use the seeds of the wild type alpha synuclein here. So, and the molecule, as you can see, it was very effective even in, if you see here, it was effective in primary nucleation. Also, it was very effective in the secondary nucleation in inhibiting that. So what we're proposing is that the molecule is obviously it's a sequestering by interacting with the alpha synuclein and then allowing the inhibition of the interaction of seeds with the monomer alpha synuclein. Now we saw that in vitro, we now move to the uh, to check this effect in uh, cellular uh, um, in cellular model, and we used a hex cell based model, which was a uh, very generous gift from Professor Mark, Mark Diamond's lab, who gave a seminar in the same podium here. And uh, what we see here is alpha synuclein preformed fibers we add to the uh, these uh, uh, alpha synuclein, which is endogenously expressed monomeric in these hex cells. And then if it is templating, you will see two kind of colors. One is a uh, uh, prion-like spread where the color will be just green because uh, there are a lot more alpha synuclein inside as opposed to we add. The other uh, color we should see is the um, co-aggregation co of these green with the, with the red. So we use this dye and you can clearly see here there is a prion-like spread. You can see green and then you can also see this uh, uh, orange color. So now we did this experiment where uh, we uh, used hex cells. This is control. This is uh, just with preformed fibers. This is in absence and presence of molecule. You can clearly see there are a lot more uh, aggregates uh, in this as opposed to the molecule. And uh, we also, the cell viability we did using MTT, it corroborates very well with the no higher the number of inclusions, higher the toxicity, so less the cell viability. And so now, how much more, how many more minutes I have? Five? I guess, okay. Uh, so now yeah. what we did, cool. Okay, so, so far what we have shown you is uh, that we are sending the seeds with the molecule. Now, next time, the this will be probably the last slides. Uh, what we did is we uh, try to create, mimic an actual uh, Parkinson's disease model. And what we did is uh, we initially send the seeds in there and then we waited so that the seed gets in, in, internalized and then we add the molecule to it and see if the molecule is still effective. Another thing we did is like to get even more closer to the Parkinson's disease uh, model, we used actual, we extracted actual, uh, uh, we have a brain bank here in our institute and we are very lucky. We extracted uh, the uh, PD, uh, these alpha synuclein uh, strain, uh, these uh, seeds from them and uh, we used both uh, these seeds and uh, uh, these brain seeds as well. Because it has been shown that the different polymorphs of seeds uh, uh, coming from different uh, resources could create different PD phenotypes. So we did, uh, we used all of them, but I'm gonna show you just this one uh, the, from the brain sample. Another thing is we need to know how much time it takes for seeds to get internalized. Uh, in the in the cells, because then only we want to add uh, this molecule after their internalization. And uh, uh, we did this assay in the hex cells, and you can see. So the, how this experiment works is we add the seeds, we introduce the seeds to the cells. After half an hour, we wash them with media and leave the cells for 24 hours. Then we introduce for four hours, wash the cells. So whatever seeds which are outside, they get washed out. And uh, you can clearly see after 12 hours, the, the number of seeds you can see here uh, per 100 cells, they were almost equal to the 24 hours. So we, uh, from that, uh, uh, we uh, used uh, the 12 hour condition because I think the, the seeds get internalized between four hour and 12 hour inside the cell. Now, 
when we added the molecule, you can see here, this is the final uh, slide really, uh, the inclusions with the molecule. And we did this for four days, you know, so we extended to see the tenacity of the, of the molecule, how effective it is. PD, which is from the brain sample, you can clearly see there are a little bit no higher number of inclusions. And uh, with the molecule, uh, there were not uh, at all in there, uh, very little. And uh, uh, as you progress from day one to day four, there was a higher toxicity uh, with the PD seeds, but with the molecule, it uh, it was rescued significantly. Uh, so with that, I'll just close by thanking uh, people in my uh, uh, students in my lab. So most of this work is done uh, uh, primarily by Jamil Ahmed. He's a graduate student, uh, very hardworking, and uh, Tessa, undergraduate student, and Courtney. So they did a lot of this work as well from uh, with help from the graduate students. Uh, the confocal microscopy and all brilliant students undergraduate and uh, joseph he did the warm work in with the help from michaela and uh, ali they are undergrads as well so our lab is a kind of amalgam of a uh, lot of things so we have a synthetic lab uh, where claire and graduate student nick and uh, uh, ryan they are synthetic people and we have another project of p53 where uh, uh, tyler uh, johnson they are working on it and uh, Daniela and Maggie, uh, Daniela is, she was working with the, all the biophysics with the membrane interaction and Maggie's a new student. So she's still uh, kind of learning all the cellular uh, culture. So, and I like to thank special to Scott Horowitz lab in our department. He helped me a lot at the beginning because when we were setting up the lab, we needed a lot of uh, assistance with the instruments and everything. And their lab was very helpful. And the Nobel Institute where Orly and uh, Lota, they have this brain bank, they told me, and then uh, they were very gracious uh, in giving us the samples to extract these uh, these seeds. And uh, obviously, University of Denver for uh, giving me the job and work here. So, and with that, I'll just close and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so um, please post your questions. Um, in in the q a um hey, magda uh Binzu yeah. is the panel you asked a question okay say. yeah yeah hi sunia very nice talk i have two quick questions first is uh do you know about the mechanism of the interaction between your drug uh, not the drug the compound inhibitor and the uh, alpha synuclein whether it's Covalent or non-covalent or both, given that so, your oligo uh, quinoline has uh, some good amount of uh, uh, functional group may interact with the peptide. And the other question is about inhibition. Have you test uh, you showing whether or without uh, your compound with uh, alpha synuclein the THT assay they, they inhibit the uh, fluorescence signal going down. Uh, have you tested, like, get some idea of a KD of the inhibition? Thank you. So pretty good questions, uh, Ben. So uh, uh, first uh, question, uh, yeah, I mean, so we have an idea. We haven't looked at really closely how the mo from the molecule side, how it's interacting with the uh, through NMR. But, uh, uh, you know, it has these, uh, so when it forms these spiral structure, it has these carboxylic acids which poke out like on the surface. And uh, and you, if you can see the side where it's interacting, I guess it's forming e these uh, uh, salt salt bridges with the uh, with the lysines uh, on the alpha synuclein and uh, maybe some additional hydrophobic interaction. So that's our uh, best guess so far. And uh, if you see the interaction taking place in these domains, because on alpha synuclein you have this uh, repetition of this KAKE, uh, and uh, there are lysines on the N terminus, so that's what we think it's uh, interacting with them. But yeah, I mean it's a it's a pretty good observation in terms of like uh, we also want to see uh, how the molecule is uh, behaving, uh, how its interactions are changed. But uh, it's such a the molecule has a lot of hydrogen, so it's very difficult in order to like. Uh, um, find out a single individual uh, uh, interactions, but uh, but yeah, it's a it's a pretty uh, uh, that's the our best guess so far. So uh, I think it answer, mostly it's a uh, non uh, uh, non. Oh, non yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry, yes. It's uh, so there is no covalent uh, interaction because we have done uh, 
some study where uh, if it is a covalent, yeah, it's a non-covalent uh, interaction, uh, 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 yeah, uh, predom, almost exclusively, yes. And uh, the second question you asked if there is an interaction of the uh, molecule with the dye, we did check it and uh, it's not an artifact uh, suppression of the signal quenching of, helpers, uh, of the uh, THT, which we have validated, like if you see in the slide I showed the uh, the THT, uh, sorry, the TEM images as well, and uh, we did other assays, uh, but uh, it's not the the. There is no quenching of the of the THT. Yes. Oh, I mean, is the inhibition potency of your compound? So, uh, okay. Uh, so one thing we did is we uh, the uh, two things we did to get that. One is the if you remember, uh, I mean, in one of the slides I showed uh, the binding interaction using the uh, polarization assay, we had less than, it was around 0.8 micromolar with the molecule. Uh, it was less than one micromolar when we did the, the, the interaction uh, uh, with the KD, if that's what you're asking. Thank you. Very interesting study. Um, there are three questions from anonymous, um... Uh, posted by uh, anonymous participants. So um, I'm going to ask with them and Rams, if you don't mind to allow uh, the attendees to ask directly the questions, I think this is the best way. So the first question okay. is um, very interesting talk. I was curious to know if there are any differences in number of alpha C nuclein inclusions depending on the time of treatment with SA SK129. Uh, early and later stage for the C. elegans uh, model? Uh, that is a brilliant question, and we have not done the late stage uh, yet. Uh, we did the early stage, as you saw in our experiment. We initially uh, give a burst of molecule like at the L1 and L4 stage, at the early stage. Initially, we were worried. We didn't do the experiments. Uh, we did not know if our molecule has the prime ability to inhibit the prime like uh, spread uh, as well. So initially, when we did these experiments, we did it at the early stage. So we haven't done that, but uh, that's the one thing we we will look forward to, to in order to do these experiments. Yes. Um, the next the next question is uh, following with an anonymous. I have uh, one more. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering if you have some idea about how does your folder mo molecule dissociate the amyloid fibrils? And kind of following uh, with the third question about the folder molecules uh, is um, wondering whether your small molecule can self-assemble, um, uh, obviously, that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty good. I mean, nice uh, questions, and we have thought about it. I'll just go with one by one. That uh, the molecule it doesn't have the ability to disintegrate diagregates. Uh, that's one thing we have observed it. Uh, uh, the other question now, aggregate. When I'm talking about aggregates, they are the final aggregates, like the THT sensitive and uh, the matured aggregates, not the oligomers. Even though we're trying to do that, we haven't got success yet with them and uh, those results hopefully will uh, show in future but uh, with the fibers pre, uh, the post matured fibers there is no effect on them now uh, the second question if the molecule self assemble yes it could if you can uh, use higher concentration for example if you go um, half a millimolar uh, or 300 micromolar, but we never reach to that stage. If you see most of our work is in within the uh, single digit uh, micromolar range or maybe uh, up to 30, 40 micromolar. And, and those conditions, when you do the UV, uh, you can see there is a, a linear uh, line. So there is no self quenching of, uh, of the absorbance, which is always a, a test for, uh, for to measure these uh, the aggregation of molecules. So we did not observe that. So the molecule doesn't uh, uh, self-aggregate under these conditions. Great, thank you. Um, Brahms, uh, can you uh, allow Sheena to join the session? Or I can read the question. Sure, sure, sure. I can allow, yeah. Go ahead, read the other question I will allow. Okay, Sheena. I can read her, uh, uh, Sheena's uh, questions. Uh, She's um, on the panel now. Oh, okay. On the panel, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Sheena, go ahead. Okay, if not, go ahead, read the questions. She's in the panel. Um, yeah, I can. Oh, okay, sorry. You kind of logged me out and logged me in again to make me speak. Very <laughs> interesting. Uh, I, it was a lovely talk, thank you. Um, I had two questions, I think. One was, is the binding of the small molecule to synuclein one-to-one? -one, and do you need one-to-one -to, -one to inhibit or does it work substoichiometrically? I think uh, the with, I didn't show a lot of other NMR uh, uh, data, but I think it's substoichiometric uh, binding. It doesn't require like one is to one uh, uh, from the analysis we have, the model we propose. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's definitely substoichiometric. I, I assume uh, we feel like the molecule inhibits the early stage, and then it will never allow the other. Maybe it's forming a uh, a dimeric kind of sandwiching between two monomers of alpha synuclein. But uh, so far, we haven't like a, a conclusive evidence about the uh, the, uh, uh, the, st the stoichiometry with which it's uh, binding. So yeah, so that's the, our best guess so far. Well, I was thinking about that for two respects. One is you, you cite a KD and presumably that's fitted to a one-to-one -one binding model to extract it's KD. And the reason I asked that was because when you showed the EMs, very beautiful EMs showing that your small molecule prevents aggregation, you seem to have oligomers in the background there, which made me think it may be binding to an oligomer and prevent uh -huh. aggregation rather than binding a monomer. And I wondered if you could comment on that. No, you are absolutely right, uh, Sheena. This is like, uh, we still trying to figure that out. The thing is, uh, when uh, there are some papers, uh, they show that uh, it goes from this monomer to these intermediate, there are some helical structure as well and go to fibers. So there are two proposed mechanisms we have, either the molecule is uh, binding with the these uh, helical structures and stabilizing them and not allowing them to move forward with higher order uh, oligomers and the fibers. Uh, so that's one, the other one is the molecule is binding with the monomer and inducing the structure. Uh, which is helical and then locking it like sequestering. So there was a paper from, uh, I guess, uh, uh, um, a couple of years ago where uh, there are uh, Wolfgang Hoyer professor, he, they have done this uh, where they have uh, these uh, Afi body they made where it sequester and uh, convert the conformation to a beta sheet and then sequester it in that conversation, kind of locking it in that and then uh, inhibiting every uh, aspect of that after that. So uh, we think that it may be one of the uh, possible mechanisms. The other one is uh, it's interacting with the uh, early oligomers uh, and locking them in that helical structures and not allowing them uh, to go move forward. So we have to do, I guess, uh, right now we are uh, forming these oligomers and trying to study the interaction, you know, with them to get the affinity, you know, then it will kind of create a, uh, definitely uh, we will find out if there is a binding is higher or lower than the, the monomers we already did, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice yeah. work. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. It's like really uh, inspired by your work, which the paper came out from your lab. We were working on that and I'm like uh, the mutations and all. So then uh, we saw that paper and it was very inspirational, you know. I don't know if you remember, we talked uh, a year ago or so. <laughs> chat when I was in New York. <laughs> it's been glad that, that myself and my students have been at Ulamac are going to talk about that NSMB paper next week and give you an update on, on the work. So a bit of an advert for if you're interested in this topic, we'll update you all next Saturday. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Excited about it. Um. Uh, I think it's about, uh, not I think, it's about time to um, There's kind a of, question uh, from Simon. Can I promote him? Yeah, to yeah, the yeah, yeah, please. Um, Simon Atanasio, go ahead and ask the question. I was going to, to say that it's, uh, it's about the time to start our um, uh, joint session when right. the attendees can ask questions for to both uh, speakers. Simon, go ahead and ask a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hey, Simon. Hi. Nice to meet you. Sorry if I don't turn on uh, my cam. 
I'm just okay. gonna read the question. Uh, I just text a few seconds ago. So yeah, uh -huh. thanks for the great talk. I was wondering, uh, meanwhile, looking at the images, if you ever tried to put on the grids for them also microtubules and not only the synuclein fibrils, okay. because this is the main thing I'm actually doing. And yeah, then I will go on with the other questions. So uh, just to start with, so we have, I didn't show the data, but this molecule has the ability. So to, uh, when we did it with the uh, LUVs, we, we generally use the lipid, uh, these uh, unilamellar vesicles. And the molecule has the tendency, like it inhibit that aggregation. And the second thing, what it does is it kind of set up an equilibrium. So when we had the, we, we used both NMR 2D and the, uh, the uh, CD, where in CD, when you have alpha synuclein, you add it to LUVs, you see a nice helical structure. When you add the molecule, uh, it doesn't completely replace it from the uh, lipid uh, membrane, like the way the PNAS paper from Professor Dobson's lab, where they show this squalamine completely uh, take it out from the membrane. But our molecule doesn't do it. It interacts, I guess it's setting up a, a sort of an e equilibrium and uh, allowing it uh, to bind with the, uh, with the protein and never taking it out from the, from the membrane. So I don't know if that answered your question, but we did the NMR as well as the CD to show that. But, and also it inhibits the aggregation. We didn't see any aggregation with the lipid catalyzed uh, um, uh, alpha synuclein uh, system. Okay. okay, I think this is also the double check you do before going to the... So you were showing some uh, KD curves. Uh, I honestly don't know the technique you were using. I use a thermophoresis technique uh, for uh, analyzing the affinity between two different molecules. I don't know if you ever uh, tried to run uh, your molecules over synuclein labeled, let's say, I don't know. And how do you check that? your synuclein it's not aggregating previously to the starting of the experiment let's say no great question so i i give you an idea so we didn't do thermophoresis and i'll tell you what technique we use uh, thermophoresis i don't think we have in our department and i know the technique very well we used to do it when i was in new york but uh, the technique we use is uh, uh, we connect, we synthetically attach a fluorescent with the molecule. It's called fluorescence polarization assay. So the idea is when the molecule with the fluorescent uh, uh, analog, uh, it will tumble in solution quickly because it's uh, small and it's free. But when you add the protein, uh, if there is a high affinity uh, complex forming, then the tumbling will slow down. And uh, we measure there is a uh, horizontal and vertical, uh, uh, these uh, 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 values of uh, uh, polarization we measure. It's a very well-known technique. Like the idea is quickly the complex form, bigger the complex forms, better you see the affinity. So, so that's the affinity. It's called fluorescence polarization. So, and okay. to answer, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go on. And the second thing is, uh, it's monomeric because uh, we have checked it like uh, when you see the aggregation, I mean, uh, alpha synuclein, the conditions we use uh, uh, when we uh, study that, uh, uh, you, you use the gel shift and you can see there are no oligomers, it's just the monomer, you know. And uh, alpha synuclein oligomerization uh, or the aggregate, it takes like days under the condition we study the, the temperature and the, uh, the pH, uh, sorry, the buffer. So yeah, okay. so it's definitely a monomeric state. We we can we are we, we we are very confident about that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, third question was uh, if you are only testing uh, those uh, set of experiments on wild type, or you're also using a mutated uh, yes. isoform. I didn't show that data, but uh, yeah. So the one cell line you saying the wild type fifty uh, the synuclein. So we have two mm -hmm. cell lines. One is a fifty three t, and the other one is wild type, and we didn't see any difference actually in the activity of molecule. It was very active in that. We also did the aggregation of this molecule with the, those uh, uh, A53T, A30P, and E46K. So all of them, and uh, we saw uh, uh, we saw similar effect of the molecule. And it's a consequence of the fact that the molecule binds on those domains. 
Uh, mm. Because if you see the molecule, the binding sites of it, they are on the domains where these uh, these uh, 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 mutations are. So uh, it may have a decreased affinity a little bit. We did not observe it so much, uh, but uh, uh, we saw a complete uh, inhibition of those uh, in both cellular and in both uh, in the other uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, tubes as well, like the, the aggregation profile. So yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks yeah. a lot. Okay, I have questions. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Rams. Um, okay, great talk, Sudita and Sunil. And let me ask questions to Sunil first. Um, great talk. Um, you said that your molecules can disrupt the membrane bound alpha synuclein. Um, is it true for any kind of lipid composition? We have not tried a lot of compositions. A bunch of them we tried. We kind of mimic our system with, uh, as I said, this paper came out from uh, Professor Late Christopson now. Uh, he, uh, uh, they have done it in this PNS paper in 2017 where squalamine, a natural product, so its effect is it uh, scoops out the protein from the membrane. So, uh, so we tried under those conditions uh, Two conditions like at higher obviously I guess if I remember uh, 10 and 20 uh, higher lipid ratio than the protein and uh, we see that the molecule uh, keeps that in helical state though the helical intensity decreased which may be that it's uh, uh, inhibiting the oligomerization as well but uh, it never completely scoops it out so we did the 2D NMR as well to show that you know so uh, so yeah and Excuse me, it, it inhibits the aggregation as well significantly in, in lipid membrane. So do, do your molecules themselves partition into membrane? They have not the time limit, like as you see, like when I showed that it has, they have the tendency to cell permeable, but that's like a few hours. So when we did this assay, the, the time points, I don't think uh, they were so partitioning in the membrane itself, uh, at least not in high amount, I would assume, you know. Because that we did it in like two, three, four hours, and uh, if you see when we did the internalization assay in the membrane, it takes longer. You know. So I would assume that if you have anionic lipids, the your uh, end terminal segment of alpha synuclein should be interacting through electrostatic interaction with the lipid head group, and your compound is also competing for electrostatic interaction. Uh -huh. so your compound has to partition into the membrane. Would that be a possible mechanism, or how does this work? Um, so, uh, you know, the binding affinity, that, how do the binding affinities compare between your molecule with the membrane, your molecule to alpha synuclein and alpha synuclein yeah. to membrane? Which one is... We have, we have not done that experiment. I mean, I'm straight, but we are now exploring more and more with the lipid ones. Uh, but uh, so far, the system we developed at the beginning, uh, we did obviously the aggregation and all with both lipid and without lipid. But uh, now, obviously, we're going to move forward with that aspect. Actually, we are, as we speak, uh, trying to do those experiments, you know, with the membrane, actually. Uh, that would be very interesting. But uh, we have not done those experiments uh, with that much detail, yes, yet. I have another question. Your toxicity data for between day one and day four. Uh -huh. Day four, even in the presence of your compound, toxicity seems to increase. Uh, day one is uh, small, I think. Small. Uh -huh. Day four, it increases. It's possible that your compound is falling apart. So we have these kind of molecules. We have seen they are very stable in the plasma. Like if you uh, were saying that uh, the cellular uh, milieu, if they are stable or not, uh, they are pretty stable. I mean, uh, just to give you an idea, like they are not the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, uh, they are not peptides. They are very protease resistant. So they are synthetic peptides, if you will. And the uh, other thing is, I, I'm not sure if that's the case. I, the, 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 what, what's happening, I assume, I, I can give you, uh, tell you that uh, as you go on in these hex cells, it has been shown from uh, Professor Virginia Lee's lab that uh, even in hex cells, they are initially, they mimic the Louis body concept, like initially you have aggregates which internalize and then they keep on forming and at up to four day, you have, in, in I'm talking about 
initially in absence of molecule there are these lewy body formation you know they have shown it with different markers and we are also doing the same thing but uh, with the molecule uh, if that's the case then uh, if it goes from day one to four from aggregates to lewy body then uh, i guess the cells are under way more stress up to day four you know nobody has shown it by the way uh, i uh, we have seen uh, some papers where they show it for just one day but we were just trying to extend it the other is to answer your question to the stability of molecule we have done it in c elegans which has much more closer uh, these prote proteases and all closer to human humans and uh, our molecule was effective for much longer like uh, for nine ten days if you see the data yeah great uh, Vijay, you are on the panel. You can ask the questions. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yep. Thanks, Rams. Um, I have a question and a comment for Sudipta. Um, Sudipta, I think it's a beautiful talk, and I I really enjoyed it. I have a um, a naive comment, um, an observation that we have seen repeatedly is that um, although you talk about transiency of oligomers, um, that is. Uh, true for an on pathway oligomers that 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 goes on to form fibrils but uh, many a times we have seen in presence of membranes and lipids and liposomes and we can actually trap uh, the oligomeric state for a quite a long time and uh, and of course it eventually progresses to fibrils of some kind but the the, the half lives are significantly increased and we could we could do a lot of biophysics on it um, but that's what that's my number question number 1 where um, do you um, see similar um, increased half-life, although they are transient, uh, such that, that they are, you know, you can call them um, an off-path with stable oligomers. And the second question that I have is the anti-parallel beta sheets that you observe. I, we, we've read your paper also. We've also uh, gone through some of the paper. We've tried to look for such oligomers in the presence of membranes in our systems. We could never, ever get any anti-parallel. We all have parallel beta sheet oligomers and that to OC positivity. So I, I, I wonder what, what your take on it. Okay, so uh, the first question, <clears throat> I think uh, that's sort of our, uh, that's a positive part of it, that uh, the oligomers, they are in some pathway of aggregation and you can manipulate it as I also responded to Marty, you can have conditions which will change the free energy landscape that takes you from monomers to the fibrils. And therefore, you can both have uh, barriers which will stabilize the oligomers. For example, ionic strength is one, it will mm -hmm. stabilize it. But you can also have <clears throat> agents which will reduce the barriers. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely possible that uh, with membranes, with other things, <clears throat> you can make them more stable or you can make them less stable. But the point is, <clears throat> you can uh, manipulate this. And if we believe that the oligomers are toxic, some oligomers would be more toxic than others. So if you can channel the, channelize the population flow from the monomer to the aggregates, which are believed to be non-toxic or less toxic, through a pathway which is less toxic, we are in. And as you have already shown that if you look at the FF19, L34, that's one of the proofs that such a thing can be done. So the short answer is, I'm not surprised at all. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. if you play around with your uh, conditions, you can stabilize all of The second question is actually, uh, that has to do with, um, uh, so uh, sorry, the second question was you're, you're asking- Anti-parallel uh, um, oligomers. Anti-parallel medications, yeah. So that has to do with which age or which size oligomers you're looking at. So it's very critical in this game. And uh, many people make this mistake, believing something is monomer when it is actually small oligomers, believe, believing something is quote unquote oligomer when it's actually very large and I, very large things I won't call it oligomers. And uh, those OC11, et cetera, actually look at or interact with uh, oligomer sizes, which are much larger. If you look at our paper in 2017 by FSJ, we show that in about three hours, there is a transition from uh, you know three hours starting with uh, 75 micromolar so uh, you know the speed of conversion depends on the initial concentration about three hours there is a conversion from anti-parallel to parallel not only that there's an atomic level coordinate that you can follow 
it goes hand in hand with a salt bridge in EBITDA 40 between uh, K28 and D23. So many people will call that post three hour thing also as oligomers. They will say all oligomers are parallel. But when I say small oligomers, I mean dimers, trimers, tetramers, mm -hmm. N less than 10. And you look at it and you will find them to be anti parallel. There's just no doubt about it. So I think it's a size issue. And we actually, all of us, you, me, and all of us, have mm -hmm. a responsibility to, to actually define, uh, when we say something like oligomer, what exactly do we mean? And I think this creates a lot of confusion. Uh, when somebody says oligomers do this, somebody else says oligomers do that, actually they are probably talking about different topics. Yeah, that's so definitely a definition um, issues. But we, you have done beautiful work in the thermodynamics of aggregation. I've seen a couple of your papers. Oh, thank you. No, I, I think we have... Uh, we have, so the problem, as you correctly pointed out, is a, is a question of what is a low oligomer weight, uh, or low molecular weight oligomer, and a high molecular weight oligomer. So the definition is not clear, and uh, and of course, um, uh, the, so the other part was connected to this is that if, if you've seen this, the out of register oligomers that I think the David uh, published some time ago, um, that was very interesting by itself because that is significantly um, similar to the fibers, but they're different. Um, um, and the, what, do you, what, what is your uh, what do you think that that is it is it possible that such oligomers would exist um, in um, in on pathway transiently? Because yeah, the so, thermodynamics uh, of conversion very... also is going to be a big problem, isn't it? If you are anti-parallel and you have to go to a parallel beta, uh, beta sheet fibers, you're going to uh, you know cost of uh, thermodynamic cost is pretty high. At some point, you have to overcome that. Uh, very nice, and uh, that's a very good comment. But the most interesting stuff I've read recently is from Tico, who has this, uh, is it Cell or Nature paper, uh, the structure of the A beta fibril, where he shows that the core strand is parallel beta sheet. And on the side, there are two strands running, which is exactly like our anti parallel beta sheet. So actually, the anti parallel, the oligomeric, quote unquote, oligomers can, without conversion, can probably become parts of those fibrils. And in that case, the whole game changes because then the fibrils become reservoirs of what I believe are toxic yeah. species. Yeah. So I think you know that, that that's very tantalizing uh, work by uh, Tico and uh, between our, uh, believe, uh, our results and his results, I think it does not need to convert. And if that is so, yeah. then the fibrils can also be toxic because they're just sequestering those. The outside strands are uh, there's a very funny, I don't know if you remember, very funny uh, yeah, kind of structure in the middle. Yeah. And yeah. the outside is like this, exactly yeah. our kind of antiparallel beta sheets. So I think uh, conversion is not necessary. Maybe part of the fight. Thank you, Sudhita. Nice work. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for the questions. Hey, Sudhita, I have a question. A very nice talk. Uh, do your do your oligomers grow in size as a function of con? Maybe you mentioned, I forgot, um, in your talk. Do they, how stable are they? Do they grow in solution or in membrane? Can you can you give us some insights into that? Okay. So in solution, they will clearly grow. And I had shown yeah. in one of the slides, you can follow them every minute uh, if you want. And you clearly see a large group sort of separating out from a monomer kind of group and slowly increasing in size up to 24 hours and so uh, they're in solution. So you can, they will keep growing. The basic point is that the thermodynamics roughly uh, works here, basic simple thermodynamics. If you have, say, a supersaturated solution, the oligomers will keep growing. Okay, so there is no doubt about that. The mm -hmm. other point is that if you want to stabilize them, can you stabilize them? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Ultimately, they will uh, aggregate, but uh, as uh, 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 Vijay is also saying, and Marty said also, you can change solution conditions. Temperature is one big player, and you can probably stabilize the large oligomers. The si situation is different in the membrane. But I think for A beta 40, and this I'll be very specific about the nature of the things, in artificial bilayers, there is a certain structure. And this structure probably does not aggregate further. So it may be a tetramer, maybe a pentamer, maybe a slight mix, but it sort of a makes a close structure with nice solvation on the outside. Solvation here is in the lipid phase. So it's hydrophobic on the outside. And we begin to see something which is small oligomers, which further probably would not aggregate. So we have followed uh, things in cells and in membranes for days, but not for weeks and months. And for days, 
they remain as these small structure but um, yeah it is possible that at a longer time scale they will start aggregating that i don't know but again there is a quasi stability that's coming in but they may be forming some kind of structure which may be ion channels that i don't know but it's so the study is consistent uh, yeah, that's great okay studies have shown that ganglioside uh, play very important roles in, in the toxicity and formation of toxic species uh, do you see that or do you see your oligomers to be dependent on ganglioside presence okay so um, we have come from two sides actual neuronal membrane and mm -hmm. from uh, artificial lipid bilayers which did not have ganglioside but we went into looking at the phase separation so there is a lot of uh, literature about phase separated membranes and we have clear results i didn't show them today which shows that in phase separated membranes some oligomers iapp for example absolutely prefers about 7 to 1 the uh, Uh, the liquid phase okay the liquid disordered phase ld phase not the allo phase on the other hand amyloid beta doesn't seem to care so much and this is something that we are very interested in because uh, it seems like the neurotransmitters can also play a role in this phase separation is well known that uh, suppose you have alpha synuclein aggregation is the uh, dopaminergic neurons which are dying if you have uh, Uh, alzheimer amyloid beta alzheimers is the uh, acetylcholinergic and serotonergic things are dying their nature is trying to tell us something and is i think to do with how these neurotransmitters work on the membrane we have separate couple of papers this year on the the membrane interaction of neurotransmitters but ultimately this is the question in my mind so short answer is no we haven't played with ganglioside but the bigger picture is that how phase separation how membrane order affects aggregation and uh, attachment one has to be very carefully uh, one has to care, look at care so other thing is that binding of a beta or even iapp to membrane uh, at least lipid membrane uh, we do see a lot of people people have also seen that it disturb the membrane structure and remove the lipids as well and so do you see that in your experiments with your oligomers and they also only grow at, into from fibers only at high concentrations how high is that typically stayed with the membrane experiments uh, at about 100 nanomolars or below sometimes even picomolar oh, okay. nanomolar one nanomolar on at those concentrations nothing changes okay mm -hmm. i mean okay the, there is some ordering that changes we are doing also solid state nmr with it and uh, there is some ordering that changes but the if you look at a flat supported lipid bilayer nothing changes at say about 100 nanomolar or lower but at very high concentration it has this detergent kind of effect and i'm not sure how physiological that is may or may not be oh, why do you think it's not physiologically relevant because that, what matters is only the local density right right not i agree so if you do have matter. the plaques and those yeah. are doing something absolutely relevant but if you are thinking about small oligomers going from one region of the brain to something else the concentrations are low if we believe the clinical uh, study is there you know nanomolar and so that at that concentration i do not think it will happen but oh, there are two different regimes sure 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 but to start some with, of your work uh, is there yeah. i know yeah so uh, to start with as i always say that these a beta peptides are cleaved in the lipid membrane so after all they are exposed to the lipid world first before even to other stuff so lipids have to play a role the concentration has to be pretty high uh, local density i would say not overall concentration so um, it's still a lot of things to be um well studied here yeah very nice stuff very nice stuff thank, thank you very you. much thank you thank you hey, thanks hey. for organizing this whole thing there's uh, been zoo yeah is, uh, yeah wonderful. this is what i wanted to tell you rams for whatever reason i can't allow them oh, into you are co-host as well so okay yeah. then go ahead Uh, hi Ram thanks for letting me ask question one more time uh first yeah, i want to say hi to madi we have met <laughs> hi madi good to see you here hope to see you more often has uh, this question for subrit uh, dr maybe so you at your early part of your talk uh you talk about the uh the thermodynamically the oligomer is not stable and ultimately it will become monomer or fibro is that what you're proposing because that's a very interesting idea because in all our experiments maybe you know you tested limited the number of uh, amyloid protein 
uh, in all our cases, we also like at the later stage, like up to like maybe weeks, we saw like existing of both oligomer and uh, fiber, mature fiber, like under uh, TEM observation. So I was wondering whether this is maybe specifically only to your protein or it's a, like a kind of a general uh, 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 theory. Very nice question. And the answer, I think, lies to something that I was talking to Vijay about. Things that you see under the TEM are already very large. I actually would not term them oligomers. So I think it's a terminology question. And those are aggregates. The aggregates could be of different uh, shapes and sizes. And as they become bigger, it's pure uh, you know, entropy that will, you know, if you get entangled, conversion between them would be slow. When I say oligomers, I should actually uh, clarify, I'm talking about n less than 10. Okay, I'm talking about small oligomers. Those things are not stable. They will become things, but people call even 100 nanometer object oligomers. Um, it's a terminology difference. And those things may, may stay for, I don't know, years. I have no idea. But uh, I think it's, we should all be careful when you talk about oligomers. So I'll say n less than 10. I see. Thank you. So the other question I have, you, you did like a chemical shift of oligomer and uh, fiber and uh, show the difference between in one of the like middle parts of, uh, of your talk. So how do you able to actually, do you have to purify oligomer? Because normally I would say this is a very tough situation. They are all kinetically interchangeable in most people's mind. Were you able to like to, you have some special method to freeze or somehow to purify uh, one uh, like a species versus the other? Yeah. So that was what sort of the brainwave we had about six, seven years ago. There is no purification. So we are following this aggregation as a function of time continuously with, a, uh, with um, uh, fluorescence techniques. We flash freeze them. So the evolution is takes 10, 20 minutes. You know, you can see the size increase, et cetera, with FCS, but they're not uh, happening in seconds. They travel. At a given concentration, let's say less than 100 micromolar, it takes 10, 20, 30 minutes to appreciably change at all. So we literally spray that solution at a particular time when uh, my FRET and my FCS is saying that something is changing. Before that and after that, spray it in liquid nitrogen. And it's frozen and it remains there. Okay, minus 40 is where we keep it. And uh, we do NMR. The, the big problem was that this is a few micromolar, say 20, 30, uh, sorry, 30, 40, 50 micromolar, and it will be huge amount that you have to pack in the NMR rotor. Can't do that. So the idea was to go to a buffer, so which will be evaporate. Uh, you can evaporate in a uh, in a lyophilizer. So it's ammonium acetate buffer in water. You evaporate in the frozen thing at minus 40, both the water and the buffer. So you have uh, in the cold powder of the oligomer frozen at that. And if it's minus 40, nothing happens, then that's the assumption. We have to verify that also. You pack it in the rotor and do it, do the experiment. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the technique we have followed for that and all the subsequent papers. Thank you. I, I, you cannot isolate oligomers. They will, people say, you know, I will have issues with somebody saying trimers have been isolated. Though are non, they will uh, reestablish an equilibrium between monomers, trimers, dimers, uh, tetramers, or whatever. Okay. So Sudipto, I have a question, uh, if that's fine. Sure. I don't know if somebody else is asking, but uh, uh, I was wondering, so when you showed the, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So when you showed these, uh, uh, these uh, oligomer uh, in one slide of uh, different 1 to 40 and 1 to 42, and they were toxic both. Uh, and I was wondering, the 1 to 40, uh, takes much longer to aggregate in comparison to 1 to 42. And uh, so uh, do you, ha do you uh, hypothesize that these two, uh, uh, they form similar like a oligomer pattern or it's completely different? And uh, if uh, they both like, there are a couple of variables, like one is parallel and anti-parallel, which I don't know if they both form the similar way, but would that be affected by their kinetics? Because one of them, I guess, at least when I did, we did these experiments, the aggregation was pattern was under the matched condition was way different, like 40 takes much longer to aggregate. 
So I wonder if you have some. Yeah. So even if you think about uh, nucleation dependent aggregation, it's really the ratio of the concentration divided by the saturation concentration that determines the kinetics. It's actually an exponential of that. So. Uh, a beta 40 has much higher saturation concentration. So it's much slower at the same concentration. So you, you should always look at C over C sat and then uh, compare them. Uh, even then it's very, very high powers of uh, this thing. So it, it goes all over. No two aggregation takes uh, exactly the same part. But coming to your question, whether A beta 42 oligomers are anti-parallel or how do they look compare in comparison with A beta 40? The short answer is I don't know, but there is an interesting issue here. There is another um, atomic parameter that evolves in a beta 40 as it transfer goes from anti-parallel to parallel. You have this salt bridge forming D23K28. In the a beta 42, that salt bridge is not there. It's a salt bridge between K28 and the terminal 42. What we are thinking now, whether the a beta 40 oligomers have a salt bridge, which is not D23K28 because we don't see it, but instead some interaction between K28 and the C terminal. And probably that's what makes it toxic. It's all a hypothesis. We are running something called a double mutant cycle, uh, changing both K28, acetylating it, and the C terminus, and comparing between 40 and 42. So I will have some answer hopefully in a few months. But it's a very interesting question. We keep thinking about it. Why? What makes 42 so much more um, toxic than 40? So if you change it's a different issue. Okay. But if you change it instead of acetylating, like, oh, so N terminus, you're saying, okay, okay. But if you change these bridges, like, for example, with the uh, smallest, like glycine uh, or alanine, like where there's no, like, you consider that as completely gone, I guess uh, maybe you guys are doing it. So it would be interesting to see the. Uh, they, but yeah, it's a stark difference. I was like amazed how uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, both of them, a slight difference, and then it works so so different. You know. Carmelo, can you ask ask your uh, questions? Yes. Carmelo, you are muted. Carmelo, you're muted. Could unmute. Ah, now yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to know what uh, type of phospholipid uses uh, your experiment in the interaction between uh, beta and uh, lubes, because the interaction uh, is strongly dependent of the type of. Uh, Phospholipid use it because if you use the charge the negatively charged phospholipid or deuterionic change. You yes, use deuterionic or change charge the phospholipid. Yeah. It's very much it depends very much on the charge on the phospholipid. So we use both types. Uh, one, uh, our standards are, they're not too f physiological, but one is a negatively charged. It's a POPC, POPG, cholesterol, one is to one is to one, which is a mm. homogeneous membrane, negatively charged. The other one is uh, uh, DOPC, X finger myelin, and cholesterol, two is to two is to one. And that actually phase separates, but that's a neutral membrane. And uh, mm. yes, the attachment is much stronger for the... Uh, the negatively charged membrane, which is a little funny. I really don't know answer to that because A beta at uh, pH 7.4, where all our experiments are, is itself negatively charged. And we thought one of the lysine residues are actually controlling it, but we have mutated or uh, actually acetylated all the lysines and it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. So I really don't know. But yes, uh, it does depend a lot on the nature of the phosphate. And uh, you observe a change in uh, kinetic uh, about kinetic of uh, fibril formation or pore formation, dilegage experiment? Uh, the kinetics of, uh, we look at kinetics of attachment. Um, I haven't really uh, seen a pore formation yet. We can look at uh, calcium leakage, but there is always this question of whether they're really well-defined pores or uh, part uh, disturbance of the membrane. 
and uh, we have tried size dependent uh, dyes and putting dextran and all the answer i must say is equivocal as something that i'm not going to say in public uh, because i'm not very convinced about it so i i think i'm not absolutely sure other people have uh, claims to have seen actual pores under the afm and all ratnesh lal and all have seen it but i haven't been able to see the pores we do also some afm uh, so i don't really know whether it is real pore formation or part solubilization some disturbance i really don't know okay thank you for a very nice uh, talk thanks sir uh, thanks a lot for your question um i we, it's uh, almost lunch time for us <laughs> i'm joking um uh, any anybody else the last minute uh, questions uh, we can take one more uh Sudita, you had you ran out of time. If you want to just give us the gist of your dynamic studies, go ahead. We can use this. Oh, that's fantastic! I'll take two minutes and <laughs> uh, uh, do it. Let me share my screen. And uh, okay, somebody else's screen sharing will stop, so I'm going to do it. Okay, and uh, hold on one second. Just give me a minute. I that closed that. Okay, I'm ready. Share my screen. Here it is. Okay. So um, I'll just say that this is, uh, you know, this actually this part of my talk uh, came from a, a scientist from the pharmaceutical industry that I met, and the question was, uh, if these disorder proteins don't have a structure. how do you ever design a drug for them because they start pharmaceutical scientists start from a uh, say the structure of a protein and then they start, uh, do a ligand so we thought in a different way we thought okay that's a very beautiful question but <clears throat> we know which parts of a beta are not structured from our um, nmr experiments so we said that maybe dynamics can guide us and we built an instrument it is nanosecond fluorescence correlation spectrometer which is um, you know very high sensitivity because we use two lenses etc but that doesn't matter we can look at a few tens of nanoseconds what the dynamics of each part is where we are putting in the uh, fluorophore and then and is the n terminus because for different reasons we know that the n terminus actually is uh, uh, loose even for our uh, nmr experiments and looked at some things which are believed to be lowering the toxicity of amyloid beta you see resveratrol and um, uh, epicatenin egcg etc and he said okay these are known we will put them in this solution just look at the dynamics of nanosecond dynamics of a part of the protein if the dynamics changes then i know that thing is interacting even though it doesn't form none of this forms a very stable <coughs> aggregate or uh, complex with a small oligomer and the dynamic changes and you can score it you can assay for it so we said well if there is no structure use that as an advantage look at the dynamics if the dynamics is perturbed to the degree that is perturbed your drug candidate is interacting with that part with to that extent and this i thought was a very nice uh, work by one of my students um, uh, though we haven't been able to progress beyond that because you are not pharmaceutical scientists but that's what i wanted to show Thanks for the opportunity to show it. Great, great. So, Magda, it looks like we're done. Great job. Um, thank you both very much, and thanks to Mori and Magda. Thank you all very much. So, do we have the permission to post your talks in YouTube? We can send you the videos. I know we need to delete the portion where yeah, Sudita uh, didn't want to be recorded. In slide number thirty and beyond that, um, just okay. delete everything. I will ask Bikash to send it to you, and then Bikash, are you there? I'm not sure if he is there. Okay, he will send you the uh, video recording, and then he can point to that. And Thanks we'll a lot, go. Marty, for this opportunity. It was great, and this series is really going great. Uh, me and my students learn a lot, so thanks a lot to you, Bikash, and Magda for it. And thanks, Marty, for sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Marty. <laughs> Thank yeah. you everybody. Yeah. It's midnight for um, it's midnight for almost midnight for Sudipta. So good night to Sudipta and very good morning to Sunil. <laughs> yeah.
you know mm-hmm. yesterday i got the uh, the vaccine as well so i was thinking maybe if i get fever or something but i survived yeah. i get so. fever up and down that's why yeah yeah, yeah. nagged out to handle the things yeah thank you guys so much i really enjoyed it and learned a lot um and thank yeah. you everybody for that thanks, thanks for all the nice questions